Hi, good morning, everybody. We'd like to thank you all for, um, for joining us today. Okay, I will share my screen. I do have the slides. I did disseminate them. Um, please advise in case they do not load, but you should see my slides. No. We see them. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. I want to uh, thank you, everybody, uh, everybody who joined. Um, so I have uh, two different hats that I essentially wear. One, I, I work with uh, Crown Roads, uh, I guess, in the way. Uh, he was like, he's in reserves now with the National Guard with the cyber uh, branch. The other one, I work uh, with uh, APUS. And um, there's different components that I actually focus on. So one of the biggest things that I actually focus on is, um, well, cybersecurity is one of them. And then the other one is energy. Let me, um, so, okay, you should see my entire slides actually pop up. All right, so it's actually extremely important as we talk about the cyber, the energy, the national security, I mean, all of it is, uh, you know, uh, interwoven. I mean, there's actually no way to, to actually in, in, inextricably to extract one from the other. It's extremely important. So when you talk about these things and I don't have a good solution, but nevertheless, I will provide a solution maybe towards the end of my slides. So the agenda is, you know, so what's a big deal about the energy? I mean, that's the first thing, but uh, hopefully everybody kind of uh, understands that energy is extremely important. That's actually the largest component of our economy. The second part is cybersecurity. How do you connect the two? And then the national security. And then we have this conundrum and uh, inextricable uh, dilemma that I'll talk about. And then we'll conclude and uh, we'll take some questions. All right, so the first thing, let me talk about the energy. Energy is extremely important. As a matter of fact, everybody cares about the energy. Uh, and it's not just in the United States. It's actually that, that trend is growing globally. And what you see there is the exponential growth of an energy consumption starting back in 1950s and it keeps going and, and this exponential growth is not going to slow down you know as a matter of fact we're seeing countries that uh were not necessarily energy consumers you know maybe 10 years ago but today they are uh, and they're growing energy consumption is growing even in those countries um and then the global per capita energy consumption is growing exponentially as well. And so what we're observing is not only the energy demand, but also energy per capita. So people in countries that we consider to be rural or, you know, um, maybe less developed economies, but nevertheless, even the per capita consumption is growing in those countries as well. Uh, in 1950s, as a matter of fact, uh, an average uh, American consumed less energy than some of the less developed energy consumers in the world today. So even in the less developed uh, economies, people are consuming more energy per capita than, than the Americans were consuming per capita back in 1950. So that, hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of the energy demand and how it's growing. Uh, and unfortunately, or it depends on how you look at it, I guess, but the, uh, uh, the, uh, the largest component of the energy production is uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, so obviously there's a lot of environmental impacts that, that are tied into this. Uh, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, financial economic impacts. Uh, there's a lot of uh, energy production and energy shipment and we, where, where the energy is produced. That's also all of it is extremely important. But in the U.S. alone, we're looking at about $1.3 trillion that are connected to directly to the energy production, energy consumption. But then if you uh, if you look at it from a broader perspective of the energy shipment, energy support, energy management and so on, that number actually goes up even higher. And so on the, on the bottom chart there, you'll actually see uh, how how the breakdown is at least in the United States, but uh, really I mean it could be well actually this one's from the world specifically and I got it from EIA but uh, but United States is a similar similar story. So uh, hopefully I made a point that energy is extremely extremely important. And uh, what we're looking at here is unfortunately about 85 percent of the energy is uh, in hydrocarbons. And the reason I said that uh, it's unfortunate is because we have to move this energy. There's a very big component of energy management that we have to look at. Not only that, from the thermodynamic perspective, uh, with, the, uh, with the hydrocarbons, the best that we could do with the Carnot cycle is about a 60% conversion efficiency. That in reality, we haven't even been able to get to that point. So out of each gallon that we, theoretically, out of each gallon of fuel that we burn, about a third is actually going to be wasted. The other two thirds, theoretically, we could, we could capture but we're not even getting anywhere close to that energy uh, conversion efficiency. We're actually at about 35 or 36. So out of every gallon, about two thirds of that, out of, uh, let's, let's do that, out of three gallons, two gallons will go towards um, inefficiency losses. One gallon will actually go towards energy production. So we have to look at essentially how the energy, how we're managing the energy and why it's so important that we're shipping. So we're still shipping three gallons worth of energy 
but we're only getting about one gallon worth of energy out of it, right? So, so you have all of these different losses. And, uh, you know, so we do have to look at alternate, essentially decentralized energy generation, you know, to avoid the losses. And it's not just on the, on the, on the carbohydrates that we're looking at this. Also, um, you know, whenever we have the centralized energy generation, like the nuclear is another great example of it. So in the nuclear, you know, like you'll have the uh, the North Shores nuclear power plant out in Virginia and, and Lake Anna was specifically built to support that nuclear power plant. Uh, out of that nuclear power plant, it produces so many megawatts of energy um, you know, that they have to ship it to, to other states. And you're looking at about a 40 to a 50 percent loss uh, whenever they cross the state line. So, so enormous losses, you know, that essentially we have. But, um, you know, the, the way our infrastructure, you know, has been built uh, for for these centralized energy nodes, if you will, and, uh, you know, it has been built since uh, early 1900s, you know, so the infrastructure is already in place. That's sort of where we stand. Uh, is there uh, a need to to modernize, you know, energy management and micro or the grids uh, and, and the energy shipment and so on? Yeah, absolutely. But we're not quite at that point. But we, well, the problem, the other problem that actually came in in the recent, I would say, maybe two, three decades is the problem of the cybersecurity. And uh, and that's where the other components would come in here in about a second. All right, so the impact on the U.S. economy, if we're just going to talk about, let's say, 10% of our enemy uh, management was, was was disrupted. So essentially, we would be looking at about $130 billion impact on the U.S. economy, enormous, right? And where is that money going to come from? So essentially, that money is going to have to come from the consumer, right? So we're going to see a, a, a spike in gas prices and energy prices. You're, we're currently probably already spending about 9 tenths or maybe 11 cents a kilowatt hour in their houses. I mean, if we are to disrupt 10%, I mean, we, we would see that price go up as well. So utilities will go up, obviously, right? The cost of manufacturing is going to go up because all the manufacturing requires energy. The distribution, so the trucks that have to deliver everything, absolutely everything from wherever, I mean, it's it's all going to cost a lot more money. And so naturally, I mean, all the distribution of just about every expendable item out there, all of those prices are going to go up. So, and we're only looking at about a 10% disruption in our energy, right? And then that's going to be enormous impact on our economy. And then uh, from the U.S. government perspective, obviously the government puts in a lot of money towards R&D, uh, operations, you know, first responders. So if you think about it, if we have a 10% disruption in energy, uh, all of those services are also going to be cut, right? Because obviously that, that, that costs money as well. So there's immeasurable, I mean, truly immeasurable detrimental effect that's going to have be on the local, state, and national um, and, uh, national uh, levels if there is only a 10%. But imagine if it was bigger than that. But could something like this happen? Uh, well, it, it did, actually, as a matter of fact, recently. So the Colonial Pipeline hack, I, 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 uh, I don't think all of us probably remember this. It only uh, took place a couple, couple months ago, and it was... Um, it was done by this group dark side and so they, they sort of consider themselves to be the robin hoods i guess if you will they take from the you know from the the wealthy and they give it to the poor and then they made this really interesting comment they said we're not political we don't care about geopolitics we're not tied to any government um, so there's no motives like that we, we just want to make money that's it we don't want to create problems for the society we just want to make money ironically enough they actually created a lot of issues for the society because there was an enormous spike in, in uh, cost, uh, uh, you know, the cost of the fuels uh, to the consumer. So when they were talking about not creating problems with society, where well, they did, and and we're talking, you know, maybe about a 10% impact right there, you know, with the Colonial Pipeline, because there's actually the entire infrastructure is actually built just like this. So this is essentially one of the pipelines that brings fuels, you know, uh, be, uh, either from Texas or the other ports up in Northeast. So but you have that disruption, and it's just in one pipeline, and you've seen all of these states affected. So, so things like this do happen. And this was a cyber attack. So now we're talking about the energy component, the economic component, and the cyber component. And all of it is extremely important. But, um, you know, Colonia, you know, the pipelines, the, the fossil fuels are not the only ones who are vulnerable to this. And there was actually a, a, a nuclear power plant out in, and this one specifically is in India. It's a nuclear power corporation of India Limited. Um, so there was an actual uh, cyber attack that took place under controls uh, they actually realized that something was happening. They detached uh, the way the SCADA systems are working. They actually have the remote terminal units, the RTUs. They're controlled by the SCADAs that have uh, ICS information control systems on top. And then there's a control unit on top of that. So the control unit at the very top of that hierarchy was actually compromised. But they detached it from all the other units. So, so in the long run, this actually worked out. There was no uh, uh, major disruption. But the reality is that if they did not catch that attack, I mean, the, the impact would have been enormous. Uh, 
you know, for, for the country of India, because this specific NPCIL um, generation plant actually produces enormous amount of energy, you know, uh, something like 5% of all the energy within within uh, that economy, the Indian economy. You know, uh, some years ago, I was involved with um, what we call state active duty missions, SAD missions. Uh, and it's a very ironic that we actually have that name, because what we would do is we would essentially go out and we would pen test all sorts of different um, state, local, you know, um, entities, and we would actually see the, uh, how, how the U.S. Um, uh, uh, benefactors, uh, how they're um, uh, performing within the cyberspace and the energy domain. And actually, one of the um, plants that we had was plant testing one of the nuclear uh, plants. Um, and I'm going to keep things a little bit more ambiguous at this point. Um, you know, this is not to embarrass anybody. This is not to bring out any names or, or shine a bad light on anybody. This is just to talk about all the things that are actually going on. And, uh, and, and the weaknesses, vulnerabilities, the issues that actually exist. So there was a nuclear power plant where we actually did a pen test. And so the pen test itself went pretty good. The nuclear power plant was doing a decent job. What they did not realize is that there's a, a system of systems that supported the nuclear power plant. The nuclear power plant wasn't operating by itself. There were also some uh, uh, cooling um, systems in place. There were, um, you know, uh, um, a, a little bit of manufacturing that was in place. There was... Um, you know, um, uh, a support system that was in place. And so while the nuclear power plant was doing pretty good on the cybersecurity, all the other systems were not. And there was one SCADA system that was replaced, uh, that was actually responsible for the cooling of the uh, nuclear power plant, and it was not secure at all. I mean, it was, it was just absolute chaos. So we didn't actually have to bring down the entire nuclear power plant. We could just shut down its, its cooling system. Uh, and you can imagine the impact is going to be the same. We, we don't necessarily have to you know, get into the nuclear power plant. I mean, we can we can we can get into one of these supporting systems, and you would have the same effect. Uh, there was another um, set mission that was actually executed, and uh, it was on um, on a military installation. So the military installation actually did a pretty good job, but the city that was supporting the military installation, where the majority of the service members lived, they were not doing that good of a job. And uh, so, unfortunately, where the service members were living, for them to get into the military installation, the city would if the city gets shut down then inevitably the military institution shut down the same way. So I hope you see how all of this is interconnected. You know, we're not just touching a colonial pipeline. We're actually affecting all the states and economies of it. We're affecting the, the energy systems. We're affecting the, 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 the you know, first uh, responders. I mean, all of these things are interconnected. And that's why it's we have this interwovenness. We cannot, you know, it's an inextricable dilemma, but we have to talk about cybersecurity, national security. But the energy component is probably the largest component of, of our uh, economy. So anyway, so how bad is it? I mean, I don't want to say that it's bad. I'm not. I'm not really sure if I'm qualified to say what is good or bad. But um, but nevertheless, I mean, there are issues uh, you know that need to be addressed. And so um, from the perspective of, of cyber or, or just code injection, you know, there was this uh, experiment that was done. Uh, back in 2007, so um, with Idaho National Lab and, and several of the hackers uh, from, the, from the government uh, pentesting community, they were actually able to demonstrate back in 2007, look, um, you can shut down these entire SCADA systems and you, and you can do it with, with little pieces of code, all right? Uh, and this is actually, you, you can actually find um, videos on this. IML actually published this extensively. They, 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 um, they, they uh, presented on this in many conferences. But the entire idea is, can you bring down a generator within within whatever power generation station or whatever, whatever you want, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be necessarily energy related, but um, can you bring down any type of a system? And, and the answer is yes. And you can do it fairly simply with a little bit of code, right? And, and that's essentially what they demonstrated. And so I think the point that we're trying to stress there is, look, we have to take the cybersecurity thing extremely seriously, but are we taking it seriously? And I don't think, um, I don't think we are as serious as we need to be, you know, and this is something to, that needs to be discussed, um, you know, but there's a solution to it as well but, uh, that I'll talk about later on. I'll talk about some of the other uh, cyber attacks that actually uh, end up happening. Operation Orchard was a really interesting case. And, um, you know, we're talking about national defense specifically. It was air defense artillery and they had GPS systems. They were essentially compromised. And um, so the system performed flawlessly except for the GPS, uh, which essentially meant that uh, they, the Israeli airplanes came in and they, they did their job and the air defense artillery fired rockets. I mean, they responded, everything was awesome, except they missed because they were, that their GPSs were compromised. So they thought they were in a different location than they really were. So stuff like that is important. We have to think about these things. I mean, even things as benign as what we think is the GPS, 
imagine if all of our GPSs were, you know, off shifted, um, you know, can you imagine the chaos that it's going to bring? Right. So we have to think about these things. Uh, Bakshat Yankee, this, this is a, a really interesting um, case that actually took place. So a, a foreign intelligence entity somewhere, who knows where, uh, it was manufacturing all of these flash drives, essentially. And, and the flash drives actually had um, a worm or a virus. I can't quite remember all the details now. But uh, uh, And then the uh, worm essentially uh, was already uh, hard-coded into these hard you, you know, flash drives. And so uh, the idea, I think, that these intelligence services had is they said, oh, well, look, if we can take, um, if we can sell, you know, millions and millions of these flash drives, inevitably some of these flash drives are going to be bought by Americans and inevitably some of these flash drives are going to be bought by American soldiers. And is it possible that an American soldier will one day take one of these flash drives and put it into a government computer? And the answer is yes. Um, and that actually happened. And this is actually why flash drives today are, are banned on all government systems. And the reason for this is because of this thing, the Bakshat Yankee. Somebody took a flash drive that was manufactured by somebody in some country with a worm already installed on it. And one of them happening, a bunch of uh, government systems were compromised. But, uh, you know, and I bring this up, you know, the government is uh, is prone to attacks like this. Are corporations prone to attacks like this? Are educational academia, are, are we all prone to attacks like this? And, and the answer is probably yes. You know, we have to think about the cybersecurity, not just from a government perspective, but also from, you know, good cybersecurity practices, all just in general as a system of systems. We have to talk about that. All right, so the Ukrainian power grid hack, 2015, if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, somebody got a bunch of links, you know, the links were infected. They actually took them to, um, you know, a malicious um, software was actually downloaded by clicking these links. And, um, you know, are people still... Uh, clicking these links. I think they are. Uh, there was an organization I worked for. And again, I'm going to keep things a little bit more ambiguous because uh, I don't want to, uh, this is not about embarrassment, this is about cybersecurity practices. But an uh, organization that I worked for uh, some years ago, probably about five, five, six years ago now. And, um, you know, there was cybersecurity training, don't click malicious links. And then the actual, uh, uh, you know, the pen testing team or the red team, they uh, they were like, well, well, let's see if if people will actually click links they don't know and so they, they sent out these links and basically the link would t take you to a website that said file and not found 404 file not found or whatever but um uh, the idea was to actually see how many people would click the link after they got the training not to click any links and it was still enormous it was still like 20 percent of people and it was like baseball tickets like hey uh congratulations we're going to give you two baseball tickets if you take this survey and it's like 20% of the people clicked the link. Uh, not only that, there was one person specifically, and that person clicked the link one day, came in the next day, and then waited a weekend and came in the third day and still clicked the link. You know, so, I mean, like, that happens. And, uh, and unfortunately, that happens to a lot of corporations, a lot of uh, organizations where people just don't think about the cybersecurity aspect of it. And imagine if you're working for uh, an energy company and you're doing the same thing, right? The cybersecurity aspect is extremely important. And then we have the Natanz fuel enrichment plan, uh, plant uh, with the Stuxnet, probably the most infamous, uh, we believe, is a uh, cyber weapon out there. Um, you know, it was eventually uh, captured or, I guess, um, elucidated, rather, by some cybersecurity companies out in Europe and the United States and Canada and some other places. But uh, with the Stuxnet, it was really interesting because Natanz itself was actually detached from the internet. It had its own intranet. But nevertheless, uh, there was a way to actually get a cyber uh, capability or cyber weapon, if you will, uh, into uh, the Natanz uh, nuclear weapon in nuclear uh, um, material enrichment plant out in Iran. And um, what ended up happening with this, uh, the stocks and this powerful code, uh, and it was actually about the size of Microsoft Suite. So it gives you uh, uh, an idea of Microsoft Office Suite, I apologize. Now, so it gives you an idea of the size and the scope of this cyber weapon, uh, quote unquote. But, um, uh, you know, there, there are so many uh, capabilities within the Stuxnet itself that it was semi-autonomous and it would make uh, some of the uh, enrichment, you know, centrifuges work really fast. Some of them work really slow. But meanwhile, the control systems showed that everything is fine and normal. Everything's working fine. I mean, essentially, the nuclear program in Iran was slowed down by, you know, some people estimate 10 years, some people say 20 years. I mean, but the bottom line is... Um, that 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 that, that uh, threat was out there. Not only that, after the Stuxnet was actually elucidated by the cybersecurity companies, 
they end up they didn't know what it was so they just published it online so actually a very big chunks of this code are actually available online now too so and anybody can download it tweak it as necessary and, and apply um you know so the threat is not getting smaller it's actually grown and it gets worse i think over the years as we go so that's what we need to we really need to tighten up on cyber security especially in the energy sector okay so here's the dilemma so for for the national security to be successful we have to be proactive at things you know we have to gather in times we can't just wait until something happens. we cannot be reactive we have to be proactive pen testing has to be done all the time uh, the analysis, data acquisition, data analysis, that has to be done all the time. And then the systems have to be enhanced, optimized. The performance has to be tested. I mean, it has to happen all the time because the, the cyber criminals or uh, cyber capabilities of foreign governments, they're not, they're not sitting still. I mean, they're developing their systems. So there has to be this proactive, constant um, upgrades and data collection and all this stuff. But uh, there's emerging technologies, and, and, and I'm all about technology. I believe in technology. I think it's simplified our life. I mean, we're having conferences today. Everybody is, you know, all over the country. We're having an awesome conference. We're talking about these things. So I don't think the technology, we, we do, shouldn't slow down the development of technologies. But these technologies, we have taken into account. I mean, they bring vulnerabilities. I mean, cybersecurity is not something that we talk about within these technologies. Very often, we actually apply technology because it solves a problem, but meanwhile, it actually brings certain vulnerabilities that we just never think about it. I mean, video games is a great example of it. Everybody wants to plug in their Xbox and it works. You know, and I get it for the teenager. I mean, the, the last thing we want our teens to do is to sit there and try to figure out how to open up the ports or, you know, write up the, uh, the, the sockets, you know, to make sure that their video games work. Everything has to be plug and play. Well, there's a cybersecurity component to it where essentially when you make everything to make everything plug and play, you have to make everything very open, right? And nobody ever, you know, closes any of their ports or anything like that. It just doesn't happen, right? So we have to think about these vulnerabilities. I mean, how do we minimize them? So on the video game, I get it. That's one thing. But when you're talking about your system uh, that actually has be it financial system, energy system, government system, whatever may be the case, you know, now you have to think about these things. Um, there was actually... Um, I had a gentleman who was working for me and he was writing his master's thesis and um, one of the things that he was analyzing is essentially these compilers. You know, the very nice Chinese government, you know, they provide these compilers free of charge. And, and thank you very much. Um, what ends up happening, what people didn't realize, is that these compilers were actually in, injecting malicious components or installing backdoors uh, without the user actually knowing it. So, for example, if I uh, wrote up an app and that app was doing whatever it was doing, you know, checking the weather, uh, great and everything was working fine when I compile and you know we would go to uh, like App Store or um, um, you, know, you know whatever App Store and we would have to compile it to make sure that it actually works on whatever system the iOS or, or the Windows or um, you know any of the other ones but um, as you compile it through a free compiler that was provided by you know like the, the foreign government or something which you don't know I mean who was provided by but if it's a free compiler what actually ended up happening is it would inject backdoors into that app that you develop so even though the app was clear the code was cleared by um you know by the uh, the auditing agency or the auditing component of the directorate within the Apple or or Google or whoever when you actually compile it and then install it on the iPhone it actually in injected where it installed backdoors. So now your phone was compromised. And there was something like 40 or 50 of these apps that were caught. And what is actually not caught? That's still a question that needs to be um, addressed at some point of time. So, um, you know, the, the, these are the these are the issues that essentially we're bringing uh, or they're arising, you know, we have to tackle them. And then where are these technologies manufactured? And uh, unfortunately, the manufacturing has actually been shipped, for, you know, a very large portion of manufacturing has been shipped abroad uh, to other countries, you know, including uh, countries like China, right? So, um, are they manufactured? Are there is there anything else that's being installed? There's some YouTube videos actually out there where um, somebody will take apart like a keyboard or something that was brought in from China, and then they'll they'll kind of figure everything out, every electrical component except for like this one chip, and nobody knows what that one chip does and why it's there. I mean, is it like a keylogger? I mean, nobody knows. I mean, who knows what it's doing, right? And then. Do we have the time and the resources uh, to actually go through every last piece of electronic or software, you know, code, line of code, to actually check all of this? And, and the answer is no. I mean, there's absolutely no way. The resources would be enormous uh, to do something like that. You know, and then uh, can we cross validate cybersecurity of every system? Um, you know, probably not. But we should definitely think about which systems we bring into our 
greater network. So now the dilemma is how do we, with the resources that we have, how do we keep this proactive national security? Uh, we don't violate the privacy rights, but also uh, we don't slow down the development of our technology and the brain of technology. And today, so many companies are actually shifting to bring your own device, BYOD, um, which is great. I think it's it's awesome. You know, somebody needs 32 uh, gigs of RAM. Somebody does it. You know, so just bring your own device, whatever works for you. Somebody needs a big screen. Somebody needs a smaller one. You know, whatever may be the case. But uh, anyway, within hopefully this gives you a little bit of uh, things to think about as you as you develop your networks and as you um, you know go through. Um, within your everyday jobs uh, about the, the issues. Um, it gives you something to think about within your IT departments when you can think about this. But I'm going to move this back to energy. So we talked about the energy impact, uh, the largest component of the U.S. economy. And then we talked about the cybersecurity component. Now, how do we make this in such a way to where we can essentially address the cybersecurity side of things, but also uh, you know, so we, we do want the technology to, to, to be implemented every day within our uh, society, you know, bring it to the energy sector, let's do it, technology is awesome. But how do we also address the cybersecurity that are related to it? And so one of the ways to actually do it is uh, to decentralize energy generation or energy resources in general, a DER, decentralized energy resources. So one way, the conventional model is what you see on, in the red on the left-hand side is you have this one big nuclear or whatever power plant and it produces all the energy for you you have this one big port out in new york and it ships energy all the way down to alabama right i mean so that's the conventional model that's what we have as a matter of fact for the most part now but the updated model and this is actually uh, an extensive talk within the um, energy circles and within the uh, defense uh, strategic uh, i actually just said through the dsi defense strategic institute for energy and this is what they're talking about. We, we can't be this big centralized, uh, you know, where like one big, you bring down one of the nodes and you bring down, you know, five or 10% of our energy management or energy shipment, uh, 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 you know, infrastructure. So we have to decentralize these things. Um, and, it, you know, the greatest analogy that I could actually make to this is the internet. Right. I mean, can you break the Internet? And the answer is no, because you have millions and millions and millions of routers out there. So even if one router is being brought down, I mean, you have all these other routers out there that you can actually uh, route your information through. So and even within, uh, let's say you have information on one server. Well, great. Hopefully you have copies on the second, third and fourth ser uh, server as well. That's why we have the RAID systems as well. Um, you know, uh, th that's an important component behind it. And so essentially what you would have is you would have energy generation that is decentralized, you would have energy all over the place, energy being generated all over the place. So first of all, the efficiency will go up. If you remember how we were talking about the Kronos cycle and the limits on the energy consumption that we're only hitting about, you know, theoretically we could hit 60%, but we weren't even at that, we're only at 35%. And then wherever we were shipping energy across all these state lines, we were losing like 50% of the energy just on the shipment alone. So in a decentralized model, you essentially would forego that because you would, you know, you'd be locally generated and not only that, uh, we call it the Internet of Energy. And essentially the idea is that you would have like that Internet of Things, if you will, where you have all these routers, but instead of routers, you would have some sort of decentralized energy generation. And so you would have maybe photovoltaics on one side, you know, nuclear on another side, industrial uh, energy generation, like coal, whatever may be the case. But you would, you would not be producing in one centralized node. So if my node actually goes down, well, I'm only producing enough energy for, let's say, 2,000 homes. The neighboring node or maybe a couple neighboring nodes will actually provide energy to my 2,000 homes while I get my node back up. And once I get my node back up, then I'm, I'm back online. And if another node goes down, then we support him. And so essentially, for anybody who would like to, who would want to compromise a system like that, they would have to compromise literally thousands of nodes simultaneously, which would be an extremely difficult thing to do because each one would have its own security component. And so this becomes extremely important, and not just from a cyber security perspective, but also, you know, anytime you have uh, hurricanes, uh, emergencies, um, you know, there was, a, I believe it was a hurricane Ida, and I actually um, ended up talking to a gentleman who was running the micro or the grid out there. And essentially what ended up happening is whenever the flooding was taking place in one of the communities, the grid had enough um, partitioning and had enough of uh, uh, artificial intelligence, you know, to, to actually realize that something was not quite right within one of the components of the, of the grid. And so it shut down a small component of the grid. So it was it had nothing to do with cybersecurity or being hacked. It was actually being flooded. 
you know, by one of the hurricanes. And nevertheless, I mean, so they were able to partition that grid and rather than bring down the whole system, they should burn down just a little component of it. And, and then they got it back up after the hurricane uh, went away. So that, that grid gives us essential security. So let's say my node gets compromised with whatever app or whatever, you know, bad security, cybersecurity practices I have, great. It's not that big of a deal. You detach me, you know, you uh, what we call island me, you segregate me from the larger system. Let me get my stuff back in order. Let me get myself back up. Then I'm back in the, on the system, but I'm not affecting everybody else around me. So if I'm practicing bad cybersecurity uh, techniques and methodologies, well, it doesn't affect everybody else. It affects me. And then you can island me as you see fit. So within this community, essentially, you would have a decentralized energy generation. And you uh, and the impact now uh, to bring down 10% of the or 5% or 10% of the uh, our, our economy uh, or, or the energy economy would take enormous, uh, enormous efforts because you would just have so many thousands of nodes out there. All right. So uh, in a nutshell, I mean, so decentralization, I think, is going to be one of the proposed solutions, at least, that, that needs to be pursued. And, um, you know, so your best cybersecurity practices are not going to affect anybody else. Uh, partitioning. Um, so microgrid is actually one of the ways to partition it. There's actually another benefit to it as well. Current grid systems, um, at least in the bigger cities, are overloaded. They're operating at like 97% capacity. I mean, there's absolutely no way that you can bring more energy into it. You're going to start melting lines. And so uh, by decentralized, um, decentralizing energy management, um, you know, generation, um, you know, shipment and so on, you can actually bring down the amount of energy that you're putting on these overloaded lines. So there's actually another benefit to it. And the way that you can actually do this is you partition, essentially, your microgrid manages its own energy and you only tap into the bigger grid whenever you need it. Uh, the rest of the time, you actually, you know, you can operate it yourself independently. Uh, the environmental impact obviously is going to be enormous because we can reduce all the you know the greenhouse gases. The cost saving to the user. I want to talk about this one because actually a lot of people think that this is going to cost them money, but it doesn't. Uh, and there's different ways, there's different systems that are already in place. And I'm going to use Virginia. That's the one I'm most intimately familiar with. But in Virginia, they actually have a uh, specific uh, office within the um, within its uh, DMME, um, which is an energy office. And that energy office is specifically working with what we call energy service companies, ESCOs. And so the ESCOs actually bring their own money, so it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, but, but they also have to look at the scale of the kind of if, if it's beneficial to them, if it's beneficial to you. And so Virginia is actually one of the, I, I would say, one of the leading states actually in this, and, and specifically Virginia Guard is also one of the leading states in this. And essentially what they are uh, doing is uh, the ESCO comes in with their money and they put in a microgrid. As a matter of fact, there's one being installed right now in Virginia Beach. And they put in the microgrid and they say, look, this microgrid is going to save you the state of Virginia um, anywhere from 100, 150,000. They do their feasibility studies, 100, uh, let's say $100,000 uh, per year. OK, so we're going to use our own money to install this thing. Over the next 10 years that you're saving money, that money actually pays us back. Uh, and then the next 15 years that that system is operating, that money, now, now that's your savings. So from the state, it's, it's a great way to do it. So essentially they're being financed by by an ESCO energy service company. From the ESCO's perspective, it's also great because it's, it's this residual income that they get. So you don't actually have to put any money up front. The life of such system is anywhere from 20, 25 years. And as long as you know that you're going to be saving uh, enough within your utilities that you can pay it off in 10 years and you plan the next 10 years to pay off the new system, then you're in business now. Mm -hmm. Andre, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, you've spoken for 35 minutes. We really need to give time to the others because uh, the panel ends at 11.20. Okay, awesome. Let me go to the questions. I apologize. Yep. Thank you very much. I apologize. It took a little bit too much. Now you just got excited, Andre. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> so let me... Uh, let me, uh, so, you know, I, I have the pleasure of working with uh, Andre uh, in the guard side. I've moved over to the reserves and Josh is a colleague of mine in the Military Cyber Professionals Association. So I'm Colonel Brad Rhodes. Uh, let me um, uh, go ahead and share my screen really quick. I want to hit about a few key points on, on, on a few slides here just to level set some things, because obviously we're here talking about, uh, you know, at a at a space conference. I don't know why you're not, that's not what I want. Uh, let me, oh, really? You're going to be tricky this morning. Hold on a second. It's the beauty of doing things on a Mac, right? So I need to allow my, my Mac needs to, wants to, wants me to share my screen. And yes, I want to. Let's do that. 
technology, right? Technology is winning. Uh, Okay. Well, you know what? So it's not going to let me share. So that's okay. So we're just going to wing it. Okay. Uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the, the fact that we are uh, going to be concerned about protecting our space-based capabilities, uh, especially in a tactical battle space. So very, very important stuff. And so I'm Colonel Brad Rhodes. I'm the CIO G6 of the 76th Operational Response Command. Uh, in my day job, I'm the head of cybersecurity for a company in Greenwood Village, Colorado called Zavila. We do web content categorization and um, cyber threat intelligence. <laughs> And I teach on the site at Regis University and Gannon University in cybersecurity graduate level programs. Uh, so uh, as, as you probably guessed, way too many, uh, way too many uh, professional certifications because I either get bored or I like to learn stuff. Um, if you are uh, interested uh, in seeing some of my previous talks about things, uh, you can check out my GitHub. I dropped that link in there. But what I want to touch on really quick, aside from the crazy world that we're living in right now, is the fact that the military realizes that there's a direct, con a direct connection between space and cyberspace. We see things in uh, joint publications. Uh, so if you're interested, read joint publication 314, that's space operations. Read FM 314, that's army space operations. Uh, so I am an army space operations officer qualified. So I, I have the little space badge. It's really cool. I, I hit the button, try to beam up every once in a while. It just doesn't work. I don't know what's going on there. Um, I think it's because we have the space force now. Just kidding. Um, and so, but, but long story short is, is you see words in these doctrine publications that say space operations to depend on cyberspace. Uh, you know, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum is the interconnection point between space and cyberspace. Um, it's words like ground systems are vulnerable, right, to space and uh, to vulnerable to cyberspace threats. So these are things we all have to think about. So really, really important here. In the Army, we use a great deal of space-based capabilities, right? We use, we're, we're concerned about space situational awareness, GPS, so position navigation and uh, timing, um, where uh, our position navigation and timing, so satellite communication, satellite operations, missile warning, all of the things that we get from space that are our asymmetric advantage in the battle space. If you take those away, we don't prosecute the fight the same way. Right. Uh, I saw this in Afghanistan when I was there. We were lucky as an Army Space Support Team. We had our own dedicated communications package. It was awesome. In fact, we had two. We had our SATCOM package. Then we had a global broadcast system to break down just, you know, terabytes of uh, commercial uh, satellite imagery uh, to support our mission partners there. Uh, it was unbelievable how much bandwidth we were using. And then I really thought about it and said, well, if I take that away, what am I what can I do? Right. Not much. Right. That's our that's how we win. Right. And if you haven't heard the, the military as a whole, army as a whole, we're moving towards a, a terminology called uh, multi-domain operations or MDO. Um, and there's three words that we look at there, competition, crisis and conflict. Um, so competition is where we're at right now, where we're trying to modernize our forces. Crisis is where we walk up to the edge of a potential conflict with a, an adversary. Right. And conflict is where we actually conduct the fight. Well, guess what? Space-based capabilities apply and are used in every single one of those areas. And if, if you don't have them, right, then you're in trouble. Um, in my, in my uh, job as the G6 uh, for 76, the Operational Response Command at the division there, you know, we, we're talking about, hey, what is our, what's our pace plan, right? What is, so that, you know, think primary comms, alternate comms, uh, contingency comms, emergency comms, right? It's like, if, if you take away SATCOM, right? Right, and we're the suborny response, so the the chemical, nuclear, biological, radiological response for the nation. If you take away any of that, right, any of our comms packages, our pieces and parts, right? Guess what? We go back to grease pencils and acetate. Yes, I'm old. I know what a grease pencil and acetate is, right? But it's really funny when you roll that out and show that to some of the uh, the, the 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 younger members of the force. They're like, "What's that?" And I go, "That's how we used to do business." Um, but again, keep in mind that important that important point of we're moving into multi domain because. There's another portion of the word that's really important here is the contested homeland, right? We, uh, we have lived in, in, from a doctrine perspective, we have lived in an era where we said, hey, we're separated by two oceans, right? Obviously 9-11 was a blip on that, right? Uh, Pearl Harbor was a blip on that where you know, the, the, the US was attacked directly. But now with cyber in the mix, Right. They're coming after the homeland. They are going to contest anything we're doing kinetically uh, in, you know, sea, air and land. They're going to contest that in the homeland because that's where we do most of our command and control. That's where our space based assets rely. We rely on space based assets where our ground stations are, all of that stuff. They're coming after that. 
So we are going to be living, we're, we're no longer, we don't have the, uh, the luxury of living in an era where we don't have to pay attention to that. We have to now. Uh, very much like Andre talked about, uh, one of the things that's really interesting there is the energy piece. Um, you know, if I was a bad guy, right? Uh, example, Fort Carson, right? Uh, many of the new homes in Fort Carson are supplied power by the Colorado Springs Utilities. Um, and they're all on the smart grid because if you're not on the smart grid, you can't hook up to that power plant or that power generation system. Well, guess what? If I'm a bad guy and uh, I, and you're, you, the United States, are conducting kinetic operations against me, right? I'm going to, in the dead of winter, go after all of those soldiers back home. I'm going to go after their families. I'm going to take out the power. It's really gets cold in the winter in Colorado, right? So I'm going to take out the power. They're not going to have heat. They're not going to have electricity, right? And now the soldiers and folks in the fight are worried about what's happening at home and not worried about what's in front of them. Right. So and that that's incredibly important to understand uh, from an intersection perspective, space and cyber are all tied via the electromagnetic spectrum. I got a, a helpful one for you. This one you'll like. Did you know that AWS has ground station as a service now? Right. We I'm here to tell you, right, with using cloud service providers, we suck at that. Right. That's one of the things like breaches. Right. Like, oh, my gosh, there was this breach and it was a hack and it was terrible. No, like 80 percent of the problem set is the fact that folks don't know how to configure things correctly. Uh, and they screw things up. And so imagine screwing up a ground station as a service. Mm, kind of scary, right? So things to think about. There are lots of interesting intersections that you might not think about. Um, th there's all sorts of attacker families out there from insider threats, script kiddies, cyber criminals to state-sponsored advanced persistent threats, uh, hacktivists, whatever. All of them would love to impact our space-based capabilities. In fact, many of them in the higher end version of things think state-sponsored and APTs are already targeting our space-based systems. It's happening today. Um, it is going to be something we have to contend with whether we realize it or not. But really the big point here is what we lose, right? When, when you think about the different mission areas that we operate in, a couple of them, for example, position, uh, you know, precision navigation and timing or precision navigation and timing, GPS, right? What happens if we lose that? I can't target precisely anymore. Um, in Afghanistan, uh, and and in, in Iraq, when I was in both those places, we did very good precision targeting using GPS. What, what happens if that goes away? Well, now instead of hitting the target, we hit the school, right? And we cause significant uh, casualties and, and collateral damage and all of that is bad, right? What about uh, satellite communications, right? We talk about, and you've probably heard the words, uh, you know, by the commander in chief, you know, over the horizon, you know, over the horizon interdiction. Cool. Can't do over the horizon unless you got satellite communications. Right? And if I take out SATCOM, right, uh, and I will tell you the way we use SATCOM, especially for our RPAs or remotely piloted, remotely piloted aircraft, right, it, it's pretty concerning, right? I, I get, I, it, that's the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night, right? If I take out some of those satellite communications capability, we lose that, we lose those assets. We can't fly them, we can't do what we need to do. Um, another one that's really huge is, is uh, missile warning. Right. If we don't have missile warning in front of us, right, we lose our response time. Right. Uh, we saw that in Desert Storm uh, when, you know, when we had missiles that, you know, that hit this before we had the really awesome missile warning capabilities you have like now, like Sivers and stuff like that. Right. Uh, we had the old uh, the old system and that the, 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 the DSP satellites are awesome, but they're only so good. Right. And so when you take away missile warning capabilities in space, right, guess what? Uh, it's really problematic. We, we don't have that warning time. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, cyberspace uh, and related attacks on space-based capabilities, whether it's space link, user ground segments, right, are part of our adversaries and near-peer adversaries' anti-access aerial denial uh, designs. They are, right? There, uh, uh, you, uh, our, our, next, our next panelist, uh, Josh, is going to talk a little bit about China, um, but, but China is an example of that, right? They are going to do A to AD, you know, up and down that coast. Uh, and they're going to do it with, in multiple ways, whether it's a large chunk of missiles on the ground or what they're going to do in, from an activities perspective in cyberspace. Um, and the second piece of that is we need to look at those attacks on space-based capabilities as, a comp, as part of the campaign that's going to be contesting the U.S. homeland, right? So what can you do right now? Well, you, you need to know uh, where your assets are interconnected. You need to understand that space and cyberspace are intrinsically linked. Right? You got to understand those impacts and losses, and you need to know right now that space systems are a key target, whether they're commercial space systems, whether they're military space systems or whatever, they're a huge target, right? Whether it's the launch systems, ground segment, user segment, links, whatever, right? Those things are, are, are incredibly important to understand. 
Um, you know, that we operate right now, and this is something we have we have operated. When you think about what we've done in operations uh, that we just when we just ended up what we were finishing up there in um, Afghanistan, right? Obviously, we own that entire thing. Same thing in Iraq, right? We own the airspace, we own we own the space battle space, we own the cyberspace battle space, we own it all, right? We don't anymore, right? And we actually haven't for some time, especially in cyberspace. Um, in cyberspace, uh, one of the big things to think about is that that so many. Sorry, one of my cats has decided to join us today. Um, one of the one of the big things in cyberspace, right, is that everybody can get it. If you don't have the capability, you can buy it, right? And so that's something to keep in mind. One last link I'll leave you with because it's super interesting. Um, is this? Uh, it is. Uh, the link to the satellite hacking talk at DEF CON 28. If you've not watched it, I highly recommend it. It's all about getting under the downlink antenna of a SATCOM system and stealing the information because so dirty little secret. Most Many commercial SATCOM providers will decrypt everything at the ground station and send it up over the bird and down the bird uh, uh, unencrypted because it saves on bandwidth. Encryption sucks up bandwidth and it slows things down. And so uh, it's actually really easy to get data out of that. So uh, thanks CISA for this opportunity. Um, I am going to, uh, I'm going to hand it off to Josh, who's a colleague of mine in the Military Cyber Professionals Association. He's a China uh, analyst uh, at uh, the Air University, uh, and he's great. He's going to give you a few words on, on where China's going in their space-based capabilities. Um, I'm dropping my LinkedIn uh, in the chat pod. Happy to connect with anybody here, uh, but thanks for the time today, and I'll look forward to questions at the end. So, Josh, over to you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brad, and, uh, you know, uh, I think that the insights from the panelists today have been you know, very interesting, and I think it does do a good segue when, on my talk about China. So I want to get into a little bit uh, on uh, overview of China space. Of course, we're going to talk about cyber because there is that interlink there, of course, and a little bit about the U.S.-China competition in space, what I think is a weakness with China space, and then a few wrap-up wrap uh, points uh, regarding leadership similar to uh, Colonel Collins. So uh, in terms of China space, we can go back to a famous quote by Mao. He said, how can we be considered a powerful country? We can't even send a potato into space. Um, so he, at that time, Mao was looking at the USSR and the US and thinking how amazing their program was and how important you know, a space program is to being a strong country. And um, China, did actually start a, a basic space program around the same time, actually, as NASA in 1958, but they didn't really start getting going till, you know, 1964, they sent a, uh, some mice up to space and then recovered that. So I'm gonna quickly fast forward to 2013 uh, under Xi Jinping, you talking about this idea of a space dream. And you hear again, the similar narrative, the importance of space to being a strong country. Um, over the last uh, couple decades, China's really made incredible strides and advancements uh, in space. Uh, many launches. They have the second number of, of satellites in orbits. You know, with all the Earth observation, remote sensing, global navigation, uh, robotic and human space flights, Mars program, and of course, a robust uh, counter space counter space program as well. Uh, in the the rhetoric and the narrative that China puts out, they they put themselves as third in space, uh, just behind the U US and Russia, but they want uh, by 2045 uh, to match or exceed the United States. Militarily, um, going back to 2015, uh, there was major military reform. Uh, what we saw was the development of the Strategic Support Force or the SSF. And what we were seeing there is a centralization of space, cyber, electronics, psychological warfare capabilities, um, you know, to, the idea was to, you know, to, to take on the strategic frontiers of space and cyberspace and far seas. So in the SSF, we have the Space Systems Department, which is similar to the Space Force. And we have also the Network Systems Department, which you could say is, is some rough equivalent of Cyber Command, something like that. Um, in the 2019 Defense White Papers, they emphasized, you know, the importance of space, saying that safeguarding China's security interests in outer space and the electromagnetic space and cyberspace are critical. Um, and they, they made the point that, you know, this is space is critical to implementized wars. And, and another thing that they talk about is active defense, which uh, strategically defensive 
but operationally offensive. So basically, if you, you cross a red line, whether it be um, you know, to you're trying to challenge their national unity, territorial sovereignty, or something like that, there could be potential uh, use of weapons uh, in that event in space. Um, economically, um, so traditionally, China has been dominated by you know the state-owned enterprises. Uh, the China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation, or CASIC, and China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, or CASC. So these are, you know, each one of those has about 100,000 engineers, very large, and a lot of subsidiaries underneath and companies. Uh, however, commercial sector has also started to bloom a bit. You know, we saw the 2012 private investments start to open up. Uh, we got to, you know, China was wants to be a very, you know, a high-tech competitor. But that being said, there was also just an organic movement within China looking at you know spacex and that inspiration that hey we can maybe do that too or, or work on space as well uh, right now there's roughly depending on how you you count it about 160 plus commercial space uh, companies but again you know a lot of that is dominated by the state still and provinces as well um i wrote a paper uh, recently um actually it's focusing on what china calls their super factories you know we have geely galaxy space comsat these are companies uh they, they could, in, in the next year, they'll be able to make something like a thousand satellites a year. And just to keep in mind, uh, there's 4,000 satellites uh, right now, uh, active satellites in orbit. Um, there's also many uh, launch companies, iSpace and Galactic Energy have uh, reached orbit. But again, there is this tension between, you know, the commercial sector, you know, what their role is versus, you know, the military and the government. So um, that will remain. Uh, politically, um, you know, space is an opportunity for uh, China to gain leverage, build alliances. They talk about a community of shared future. They have, uh, you know, their space station. You know, they're inviting, you know, the Euro European Union and other and Russia and other other countries to be part of of this. And of course, Russia has been a, a major ally in space for the longest. And there's a lot of different projects they're working on. And then finally, in terms of legitimacy for the Chinese Communist Party, this is a major factor for space as well. If you go back to the July 1st speech, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, you know, CCP at 100 years, uh, Xi Jinping talked about um, how the party has taken, you know, uh, the people from darkness into the light and, you know, going to the stars is another good uh, branding, I think, for the Chinese Communist Party. Quickly on cyber, um, you see again this, this narrative of we must be strong in cyber to be a strong nation. And uh, Xi Jinping has always been... Uh, fond of technology and he pushed this idea of cyber being a cyber strong country or superpower uh, a lot starting in 2014 you got to see it in speeches 2016 even more and they actually made a song about being a cyber a strong cyber power as well i won't share that though um and uh recently uh there was a release xi jinping's discussion on site on being a cyber superpowers excerpts like it's a book the definitive book on cyber uh, for the Chinese Communist Party, and he emphasized that without cybersecurity, there would be no national security, and without informationization, there would be no modernization. So again, that importance for cyber. And very quickly, what they're doing uh, to try to address, you know, some of their issues that they believe that they have: talent, innovation, you know, indigenization, keeping things, uh, creating things within China. Uh, they have they built a national cyber center. It's almost completely finished. It's going to be huge, huge campus. Uh, in about a decade, they want to have. 500,000 highly skilled cyber operators. It's going to be in the government. It's going to be in private sector. It's going to be in the military and all going to be very well connected with the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so a bit on the competition with China and particularly in space. Uh, national defense strategy, our U.S. national defense strategy calls out a long-term strategic com competition with China as the central challenge to U.S. prosperity and security. Uh, a competition for space dominance between the United States uh, you know, in China and Russia has prompted, you know, Space Command to be reestablished. And we also have, of course, uh, Space Force. You guys should check out the, the new uniforms as well. Um, so, yeah, we're seeing a very uh, aggressive weaponization of space by China. And there's been a lot of recent talk about it, actually, uh, this month uh, in the Air Force Association's Airspace and Cyber Conference. Um, for example, Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall said that he, we need to focus on China, China, China. And it's impossible to overstate the importance of space-based systems to national security. Uh, Lieutenant General High Notes uh, said that we're out of time. China is caught up. Uh, Travis Langster, uh, manager of CompSec, said that you know 
what he believes is the first attack or that will happen is in cyber, a cyber attack on space-based systems. And of course, uh, Kerry Smith, CEO of Defense and Cybersecurity Contractor Parsons said, space-based networks are already under attack. Jamming is occurring today. So we, we're, we're in this you know, cyber war right now, right? And then um, also of note, General James Dickinson said, Commander of US Space Command, he said that we are beginning to conduct our own military exercises focused on space war fighting. In another uh, conference this month, the head of NASA, Bill Nelson, reaffirmed that they cannot cooperate with China. We're in a space race with China, he said, and that we, we can't cooperate because China can't be transparent. And as you, as you know, uh, we have the Wolf Amendment still in place. And there is no indication of uh, the Biden administration going softer on space as well. So what did China say to all this that just happened you know, in the past few weeks? So we have a, a quote I'm going to have from Foreign Minister Spokesperson Wang Wenbin. He said, space security is getting increasingly complicated and severe, with the U.S. being the primary factor that has an impact on space security. In recent years, the U.S. has openly defined space as a new warfighting domain, put in place an independent space force and space command, and vigorously built up military strength. What the U.S. has done exacerbates the risk of weaponizing space and turning it into a warfighting domain and severely threatens the peace and tranquility of space. In this regard, China is deeply concerned. So China, the continuous narrative is they're peace loving, they just wanna have their sovereignty. And you know, mean old United States is being all this aggressive and, 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 and crazy. And we're just here trying to just live our life. So obviously there are some problems with that, but that's the narrative that they try to, to put. So, what is you know weakness or one of the weaknesses that uh, that the China has in space? I think that in our advantage, I think is they don't have the same vibrant commercial space sector. There's incredible work being done by SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, et cetera, that's happening right now to innovate and to lead. Where China is trying to follow and just look at what we're, what we're doing essentially, um, and and with that. With that uh, commercial sector, I want to talk about the current situation in China. We have Xi Jinping going on for a third term now, which is not the norm for secession. He's talking about rectification, common prosperity, the need to study his Xi Jinping thoughts, and you know, talking about you know billionaires are not good, et cetera, et cetera. All this stuff that's happening right now, and this more clamp on control of society across the board, I think is not the same. Is not a good environment for an Elon Musk type person or something, someone in the you know, commercial space sector to, to really want to invest, you know, if they have, say, $100 million lying around. Um, you know, I don't know, like, in, the, in, in Xi Jinping's next term, you know, how, how significant this sort of common prosperity rectification will be. You know, one blogger has said it's a monumental change, and another said that it's not going to be as, as much, but that is a trend that we need to, to look into. So in, in conclusion, um, I do want to say the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, may be weak in terms of their commercial sector and matching innovation, but they still pose an incredible threat to U.S. and our allies, both in space and cyber, which is obviously interlinked. China has a robust counter space capability. Uh, top officials from Space Force, Air Force, Navy, Marines say China is gearing up for space warfare. On cyber, the NSA, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, FBI, assess that the People's Republic of China state-sponsored malicious cyber activity is a major threat to the U.S. and our allies. So what can we do? I like the words uh, that recently uh, were spoken by Lieutenant General Jack Shanahan. Uh, he said the United States government, and this is about leadership, the United States government faces a five-year window to inculcate a culture of innovation or risk falling to keep pace with emerging and disruptive technologies like the ones China and China has both in space and cyber. So leaders need to have at the highest levels of every organization must commit to making a major transition from a hardware centric industrial age mindset to a software centric information age one. And I don't believe we're out of time as Lieutenant General uh, Clinton Hynote said, but I do agree with the sentiment. We need to move faster, utilize and enhance our strength and innovation to combat the growing threat to the, cease, the growing threat the Chinese Communist Party and the PLA pose in space, cyber, and beyond. Thanks.
All right, I think that sends it over to me. So I am uh, PJ Blunt, and I'm here today in my capacity as the Executive Secretary of the International Institute of Space Law, uh, but I also serve I was an adjunct professor at the University of Mississippi School of Law in their Air and Space Law program, and I'm a research fellow in cybersecurity governance and regulation. I split my time in that position between SES, the satellite company, and the University of Luxembourg, and I'm in Luxembourg now, so uh, it's getting a little late here. Uh, in light of the time, I'm going to be uh, try to be quick here, um, and I'm going to I'm a lawyer, so I'm going to talk about this from a legal perspective and thinking about cybersecurity law in the the space domain. And I think that one of the, the problems that we have and one of the problems that I've observed in sort of the literature on this is, you know, the lawyers, just like everybody else in the space uh, world, has kind of turned to cybersecurity as this big issue that we have to address. But there's this problem from the, the legal perspective in that it's really hard to find law, right? What is cybersecurity law? And, and you know, I, I like to use the example that if you if you type space law into uh, your Google search bar or whatever um, search you're, you're, you're using, um, you'll get a, uh, a back something that you can identify as this is space law. Um, the if you type cybersecurity law into that search bar, depending on where you are, what the algorithm thinks of you that day, what else you, um, you know, you've searched for, you will get back different answers. Everybody here would likely get back something different. Um, and that's because cybersecurity law is very um, uh, dispersed, right? It's, it's sort of, um, you know, you have different things that are different laws that play into your cybersecurity posture. But those laws aren't cybersecurity laws themselves. And from an organizational perspective, it's very hard to find a law that tells you what you need to do to be cybersecure, right? There are no regulations that are like, you company or you organization, these are the things that you need to do to be cybersecure. Um, and so this leads to a problem, right? If you're approaching this from a legal perspective, what is the role of the lawyer? And, and lawyers know we have this gut feeling that we have something to do here, um, but it's hard to find the law that tells us what to do. Um, and, and so what I, I think I'll do um, is quickly sort of give a narrative of, of how you might find cybersecurity law um, and, and apply it in the world of space um, to, to satellites. So from an organizational perspective, and I'm going to use the, the U.S. as an example. I'm a U.S. attorney, so obviously it's a, a lot easier for me to, to lay my hands on and talk about. Um, and so, so if we look at, at the U.S., right, there aren't any laws that say satellite operators have to do this, 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 and this. We do have Space Policy Directive 5, which is on cybersecurity for space assets, but obviously that's policy, that's not law. So what might you as an operator need to be thinking about? Well, if we go back to the Federal Information Security Management Act, that act gives the, the National Institute of Standards and Technology the, the role of developing standards for risk management in federal information systems. Um, what is a federal information system? Well, it's it's a government system, right? But it's also a system that has federal in, federal information on it. So if you're a contractor with the government and you are going to have their data on it, guess what? NISD standards are going to be very, very important for you. <clears throat> and this is, so we, we see um, that they have developed two sort of major things. The first thing that came out really was the cybersecurity um, framework. And the cybersecurity framework was applied to critical infrastructure. Um, they have then since, uh, released a risk management framework, which is based on the same principles of the cybersecurity framework, but it has sort of broader application to um, systems that are not critical infrastructure. So the risk management framework is really important. Well, how do we get that into the space? Well, well, actually, recently, NIST has released a draft report on cybersecurity for the space industry, um, and it's a very short document um, for, for people that are, you know, into cybersecurity already, you would read it and go, this is really basic. But for people that are just starting out, it's probably a good place to start to begin to think about how you would take a risk management for the risk management framework and apply it to space assets and space capabilities. But we also see this in other areas. And so US Space Force currently is setting up a program called IA pre. Um, and this is um, <laughs> this is like the third time I've given a presentation on this and forgot to look up the acronym beforehand. I'm pretty sure the A stands for audit. I think it's um, 
uh, sorry, it's IA pre, it's, it's infrastructure audit pre-assessment. If anybody knows me to be wrong on that, throw it in the chat and, and get the acronym right. Um, but what this requires is that if you are going to be, um, if you're a SATCOM operator and you're going to contract with Space Force or the military to provide these services, then you will need to go through a, a pre-assessment by a third party that does an audit of your cybersecurity posture and make sure that you are compliant with certain standards. And in the, the early documents on IAPRE, they, I think they've chosen like 580 standards or so that need to be um, implemented for SATCOM operators that want to contract with the military. So we see here that all the way from this very general FISMA, the Federal um, Information Federal Information Security Management Act, I'm just always in a soup of acronyms like everybody else here, um, from FISMA, which is just real general to, you know, it applies to all federal systems, we go all the way down and we end up with those same standards being applied to military contractors. And as a, if you're the, the lawyer in an organization like that, um, obviously, right, you're not going to be doing that by yourself. You have an information security management team or a cybersecurity team that's going to be doing most of the technical implementations. Um, but your job is, is, is very much about compliance, making sure that you record these things, making sure that you have the evidence, because let's say there's a breach and that's what you're guarding against and you end up in some sort of dispute, whether that be with the government or with a contract partner. What you want to show up with is a box of stuff that says, yes, look, we encrypted those drives that that information was on and here is our record of doing that. We did. We evaluated the laws and policies of the state and here is our documentation that shows that we're complying with those. And that's very much the role of the lawyer is looking forward um, towards those disputes that happen after cybersecurity incidents and being able to prove that that you have taken the standards that are applicable to your systems, implemented them properly, and and um, and and that you have maintained uh, a, what I like to call an adequate uh, level of cybersecurity, because there is nothing you, you're never cyber secure, right? You, you know, there's always new threats and new vulnerabilities, but that adequate level of cybersecurity can be attained through standards, and those do have legal effect later on in a dispute. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll cut it short and maybe maybe we can have time for a, a question or two. Um, we have time for one question from uh, Terry Trevino. I've noticed SSA becoming a topic. How best do we use SSA slash SDA in the CIS lunar environment? Yeah, so I'll take that one real quick. Uh, space situational awareness is a is a huge issue that we have to be concerned about. Um, but part of it's about where we place the sensors in orbit and what we can see, right? And so right now we've got really great visibility via what the Air Force does uh, on terms of space situational awareness and all the junk that's floating around in orbit. Um, but as as we get beyond, you know, that low to medium Earth orbit, um, definitely something that is a, is something that we don't have good visibility on. Uh, and so as we begin to move out uh, from, you know, standard Earth orbit, do operations from the moon, out to Mars, things like that, we're going to have to rethink uh, how we actually do overall space situational and awareness, you know, and, and what that's going to mean for us, I think. If I could actually jump in on that, just to add something. Sure. Um, so there's a there's a guy out there, Jonathan McDowell, who has this great website with all this wonderful data on space, and he's begun to put together um, a, a deep space catalog of, of items that have gone beyond Earth orbit. Um, now, that's not SSA da data. It's more of a, a catalog, but um, it's sort of an interesting starting place to think about what's out there and what we have to be aware of. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid we don't have time for more questions, unfortunately. Uh, the next sessions will start in about 10 minutes. Uh, so thank you, everybody. And uh, please join us for the rest of the event. Thank you.